members. To understand the relationship between the City of London and the metropolis of London, you need to understand a little bit of the history. When William I came to Britain from Normandy, the French king, to conquer the rest of the country, he stopped at the gate of the City of London. He never finished the job. The French never finished the job. And the city maintained the rights and privileges that had existed in King Edward's day. Many of the things the monarch gave us protected us, so we could uh, restrict trade uh, to whoever we wanted to. I mean, today you would actually probably be in a, a court defending it as a, as a cartel or something, but that, that was the way it was, of course. We own all the bridges we, across the Thames, though over the years, from taking tolls over the bridges, we've built up quite a substantial amount of money, there, which we use for the benefit of the nation. But one of the primary is to um, protect, not protect, protect, promote the, the London's financial services on a global basis. The square mile of the City of London retains all the ancient rights and privileges and resources of the ancient City of London. And that the people who live outside the square mile, those eight million of which I'm one, don't share in those resources, uh, although we are citizens of London. Yeah, so this is the city. We use this for planning, showing that it's interactive, you can find out where you want to be. So we own about 25% of the city, the corporation. But I say there's now more foreign investors own the city than domestic. And that what you have today, you have this institution that promotes the singlest interest of finance capital. It's using this huge network of resources to promote the single issue of finance capital. Uh, it's a it's a it's a travesty of its history. We do produce an awful lot of money. What's good for the city is good good for the country, providing providing that that money is earned fairly and squarely and doesn't jeopardise. Uh, the wealth of the nation, which it has done. So, you know. Nobody, in my view, has the right to pitch the tent on a public highway and stay there and decide and tell the authorities when they might wish to leave. And I went there because at that time I felt there was nobody putting up the case. They wanted to abolish the city corporation and everything else. I thought, well, I'll go there and I'll try and have a debate. The financial services industry, it produces about 65 billion in taxes, 35 billion in uh, overseas surplus. It's been very successful because, apart from anything else, many of the other industries, of course, that used to be very successful in Britain, have withered away. And I don't make any apologies for being successful. I don't make any apologies for being number one in the world. So far from being a success story, I regard the City of London as the world's biggest tax haven, attracting billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of wealth out of Africa, out of Asia, out of Latin America, out of Europe, out of Greece, out of Italy, to where it's misused by the City of London. Stuart, I would welcome it if quite a few of our bankers left as quickly as possible. or less.
better half of the whole global offshore system is in some way British, particularly the, the, the Crown dependencies and overseas territories. And these are, in a sense, fragments of the British Empire. After the Second World War, particularly, you had a very rapid phase of decolonization of, uh, you know, the British Empire effectively collapsed. And uh, just at that moment, you had the birth of a new market in London, the, the so-called Euro markets or Euro dollar markets, which was essentially an, an unregulated um, market for, um, uh, for dollars. When the Bank of England made a decision to allow dollars to be traded um, outside of the Federal Reserve, uh, because of a quirk of British law, it didn't have to define where it was to be traded. All, it ma all that mattered was that it was no longer to be traded through the uh, New York banking system. By not defining where trades were to take place, effectively it meant that the trades were taking place, depending on how you understand it, anywhere or nowhere. The Bank of England basically deemed this transaction as if it don't take place in London. since they don't take place in London, then London doesn't regulate this transaction. But then nobody else can regulate this transaction because they actually takes place in London. The result is they created an offshore market which is unregulated. By the 1960s, the large American banks grasped and began to understand that actually by operating through London they can avoid all sorts of regulation and the market exploded. C'est la première fois que des banquiers géraient aussi massivement de la liquidité euh, libellée dans une devise qui n'était pas celle de leur pays. Depuis Londres, ce qu'on a fait, c'est qu'on a en quelque sorte réparti ce, ce, cette manne, hein, ces, ces milliards de dollars américains là qui ne relevaient euh, plus du gouvernement américain euh, dans différents paradis fiscaux, dont notamment les Caïmans, les Georgiens, et ainsi de suite. Bon, euh, donc on s'est retrouvé.